Today I'm going to be going through something that to me is confusing. Now the resurrection is not confusing at all. But when I go through the four Gospels, it's confusing where each piece falls into place. Now the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are what we call the synoptic Gospels. And they generally follow the same flow of thought. But then when you add John in there, John did not follow any kind of uh, outline. He didn't use Mark as his guide for his gospel. Mark just wrote his gospel from what he experienced, or, or John did rather. So John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. As you read through the book of John, you'll read those words. It's the disciple whom Jesus loved or that other disciple. John doesn't name himself typically when he's going through the book, or he doesn't at all. He just calls himself the, the, the other disciple. Well, we're going to see in the Gospel of John that we have the whole full story of Mary Magdalene and the ladies as they come to the tomb. And it can be confusing if you try to trace it. Now, just a heads up, I'm going to be going through verses of all four Gospels. So in the Gospel of Matthew, it would be Matthew chapter 28. In Mark, it would be Mark 16. In Luke, it's Luke 20. And then in John, uh, Luke is in Luke 24, and John is Luke chapter 20. Now, I know you're not going to be able to flip back and forth for all of these, but just to give you a heads up, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm going to walk you through the Easter story, and it's not three points in a poem. What it is, is I'm just going to walk you through scriptures. We're going to talk about some of this. Now, last week we talked about the triumphal entry where Christ came to the walls of the city of Jerusalem and there was great rejoicing. And they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the rejoicing was a temporary thing because as soon as he got in the walls, he went up on the Temple Mount and he looked around and scoped the place out. The next day he was gonna come up and he was gonna clear the Temple Mount. It initiates a whole week of confrontations, of name calling, of, of going after each other, of, of quenching arguments with, with things that couldn't be answered by the Pharisees. And so Jesus, throughout that week, is facing a lot of opposition. Then we come to his time when he is betrayed by Judas. Judas delivers him over into the hands of those who wanted to see him dead. Then we see Jesus being questioned, interrogated for lengthy periods of time. Then we see him tortured, and then he's crucified and he dies on the cross. Two of the last things that Jesus said as he hung on the cross, one of them is, it is finished. And it was finished, at least that part of it. But praise God, it's not finished. Amen? Amen. It's not even finished today. The gospel is still going out. Like he was finished with that part, and he was ready to die. And then the last thing he says is, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so he's giving himself over into the hands of God. It was then that there was a, a time between. There wasn't an opportunity for people to prepare Jesus for burial, except Joseph of Arimathea and one very famous guy that we see in John chapter 3. Who knows what his name was in John chapter 3? Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the one who came to Jesus at night. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea wrapped Jesus up in cloth and ointment with burial spices to be buried. But I don't think the women knew that when it was the night before they were to come to the tomb, the night before the resurrection. It must have been throughout the evening the day before when Sabbath ended, it ended when darkness fell, that they began to go around and collect spices for themselves. They loved Jesus dearly. They were going to take care of him. And so what they did is they got everything together. And then while it was still dark, they got up early in the morning and they made their way to the tomb of Jesus. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, so there was... We think, if you read through all of the, the stories, we know Jesus' mother Mary was at the cross, and so possibly she was there. It could have been three Marys. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, the, the mother of James the Lesser, and then there was Joanna, and then there was Salome, and then there were other women. There was a, a lot of ladies, and they were getting ready to prepare Jesus' body. Not with spices like spices that you cook with. These are special spices that you would wrap around the body 
so that when it decays, it doesn't smell as bad as it might. With that said, I think they expected to see Jesus still in the tomb. It hadn't become a cognitive thing with them yet that Jesus had already told them he was going to resurrect from the grave. In fact, in scriptures, we know the only one that might have remembered it was Mary. But the rest of them did not. And so as they came to the tomb, it was very, very dark out. When we come to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 3, it says, Behold, there was a great earthquake. So somewhere in the darkness, probably during the time that the women were headed towards the tomb, there was an earthquake, and it says the reason, because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, rolled back the stone from the door, and sat on it. Now this stone is probably tons, like a couple of tons. And it says that they rolled the stone away from the door. I was reading one archaeologist's report, and he was saying, well, it might not have been a round stone, it might have been a different stone. The problem with that is, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they rolled the stone away from the door. And so it was a round stone, probably round and flat, up against the face of uh, the, where Jesus was, was buried in the tomb, and it had to be rolled into place, and then if someone was going to open it, it had to be rolled back. Well, it was done by an angel with a great earthquake. It's then that the earthquake ends, dawn begins to break. So how many of you were here at 6.50 with me? I know there were about 70 of you, so it was a fun time. Uh, we sang a cappella, Rick led us, uh, just had a really good time, but we didn't see the sun. I did look at the Harnish Farm, and I hold it against the Harnishes that the sun didn't come up, but it wasn't there. But it doesn't matter, because we know the sun is risen, amen? He's risen indeed. And so they were making their way. It was about the time of the dawn, the time when the sun was raising, uh, that the ladies arrived there. First day of the week, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20, all indicate that it was the first day of the week, very early in the morning. We're talking about Sunday, where all of these women showed up, and it says certain other women were that with them, and they came to tomb, the tomb when the sun had risen, bringing spices. But they said to themselves, who will roll away the stone away from the tomb? You'd think they would have thought of that, right? But these were women who were on a mission. These were women that were going to do something, and it didn't matter if all the pieces were in place. They were going to get there, and they would find somebody, or they would do it themselves. I don't know why the men didn't go. I just know the women did go, and it was then to the women that it was first revealed that Jesus had resurrected. Mark and Luke indicate that the women entered the tomb, but they did not find the body of Jesus. And it's then that one of the women who seems really uptight, can't wait to meet this lady. We were in her hometown, Magdala, a few months ago, as Mary Magdalene. And as she got to the tomb and saw that Jesus' body was gone, she was overwhelmed. And she was very emotional, and she went and she ran to tell Peter and John. Now, apparently, Peter and John were together, the disciples. They knew where they were because they went and told them. But Peter and John were together in one place. So Mary Magdalene ran. She took off to tell Peter and John that, they, that the body of Jesus was missing. We have then um, the other ladies standing around the tomb talking. They didn't take off right away like Mary Magdalene did. They were discussing the situation and what had gone on. It says they were greatly perplexed. And as they were talking, behold, there were two men there with shining garments. And they were afraid. They were alarmed. They bowed their faces to the earth. And they saw a young man clothed in white sitting on the right. Some have said that Mark is writing about himself, that he was a young man sitting there. And I don't really find a reason to believe that that was Mark writing himself into the story. I think this was the, another angel. I think it was the angel that rolled the stone away from the tomb. And there he sat on the tomb. The angel responded to them. They were afraid and alarmed. They said, do not be afraid or alarmed. You seek Jesus who was crucified. Here's a powerful statement. Why do you seek the living among the dead? There's a song, I'm sure most, if not all of you, have listened to it. Uh, a guy named Shai Lin wrote it, but he goes through, it's kind of hip-hop, and I'm, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't like it, but some of you would. 
anyway, he goes through a whole list of all the people that are dead. And, uh, you know, all the famous people from the past um, who, not, who are not with us. And he keeps naming them one after another. And it really hits you when he gets to the chorus. But Jesus is alive. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And then he, it goes on to say, he is not here, but he is risen. He is risen from the dead. And then he, he, they said this to them, and this also is profound to me. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? It was told to them several times by Jesus himself, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be delivered up by the religious leaders of the day, I'm going to be crucified, and then I'm going to rise again. Just going to read a few verses from Mark chapter 8, verse 31. He's at Caesarea Philippi. And I, I love this place. I've been there. And there's a whole big, you know, mountain there. And there's a big hole where they used to throw people into the hole. And if you floated to the top, then I don't know what the deal was. They were human sacrifices. Jesus, as he walked by with his disciples, used that wall as an illustration. And he said, who do people say that I am? Well, some said Elijah, some said a prophet, some said John the Baptist. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, thou art the Christ. And Jesus said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Peter. But then the verses go on. Jesus, I'm going to read verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again he taught them that he told them that and he said that plainly and then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him oh no Lord we're not going to let that happen and Jesus said to Peter you're not representing the things of God but the things of man get thee behind me Satan and so Jesus had told them very plainly he was going to die and that he was going to rise again and so the other women were there they were told, come see where, the, where they've laid them, but go quickly and tell his disciples and Peter, it's very important to tell Peter, who is the obvious leader of the disciples, that he is risen from the dead. Go back to Galilee, as I told you, and I'll meet you there. It says in John chapter 20 and verse 8, and they remembered his words. Before that, they hadn't remembered, they didn't get it, they hadn't put it all together, even though they'd been told it, they'd been taught it, but now they're beginning to remember. That's right, he told us that. That's right, he, the, the Old Testament did say he would come to Jerusalem on a donkey. That's right, he told us all of these things. And so they began to put it all together and began to understand. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 8, the ladies quickly fled. They went, they were very fearful, and it says this, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And I would add the word any, everyone else, because they did go and tell the disciples. Now Mary Magdalene had gotten to Peter and John before the rest of the ladies did, but then the ladies went on ahead. When you get to Matthew 28, it says, now while they were going, so as the ladies traveled to tell the disciples, the soldiers had woken up from their stupor. I, I don't think I read the verses to you, but when the earthquake happened, then they were as dead. So they're laying on the ground dazed somewhere when the ladies showed up. And when the ladies went to go to tell the disciples, the soldiers went into town. And they told the elders and the council that Jesus was no longer in the grave. And so they were bribed and given a lot of money. And, uh, and they said that and when the, the rulers find out, don't worry, we'll take care of it. We'll appease them. And so they took the, the money and started to spread the false rumors about Jesus following that. The women then, Luke chapter 24, it says that, and then they returned from the tomb, told all these things to the 11. So Mary Magdalene and the other women told the disciples, and then it names the women. Then what happens is Mary Magdalene, she gets to Peter and John. Before any of the women get to the other disciples, she gets there, and Peter and John take off running. John is the younger, Peter is the older, and as they're running together, John outruns Peter. He gets to the, to the door of the tomb and looks in, but he doesn't go in. I guess he's catching his breath. P 
Peter then stoops down and goes in and sees that the body of Jesus is gone. John then followed him and went in to see that the body of Jesus was gone. Meanwhile, then, Peter and John are on their way back to the other disciples. It is then that we see Mary Magdalene again. By the way, John chapter 20 focuses a lot on Mary Magdalene, and you can, can read that sometime when you have opportunity. But Mary Magdalene went to Simon Peter. Then after Peter and John came back, she was on her way to the tomb. The other women had already seen the angels, but Mary Magdalene was on her own. She just took off. She was just overwhelmed. She was just like overwhelmed with the emotions of the day. She was distraught. She's headed back to the tomb. And it says in John chapter 20 and verse 11 and following, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels sitting in there. One at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So she's crying very heavily. And she said, it's because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener and said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where, have you, where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, this is neat. He just said to her, Mary. And she turns around and says, Rabboni. That is to mean rabbi. And Jesus said, stop clinging to me. She was touching him. Stop clinging to me because I haven't yet ascended my father. I'm not gone yet. Let me go. I got some stuff to do. But go and tell my brother, brethren that I'm ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples all the things she had seen and heard. Matthew 28, I'm just going to end with these few verses. It says this. And as they, the other women, went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them as well. And he said, rejoice. And they came and held him by the feet and they worshiped him. Our theme today is long live the king. So the, the cross, kind of confusing, right? You know, how could Jesus have to die on the cross? Couldn't have God, couldn't God have done it a different way? Or what's the deal with this whole story? The best I can tell you is one day in heaven, God's going to explain a few things to us. And probably for eternity, we won't plummet the depths of the truths of God. But I do know this, that when Jesus hung on the cross, we have an epic climax of evil and good, of love and of hate. Now, evil did not win. Hate did not win. What we have is that God hates sin. And God hates that people commit sin, and God will not allow sin into his heaven. And so God, at the same time that he hates sin, loves the sinner. He loves human beings. And so we have love and hate hung on the cross where Jesus died to pay the price for sin. He paid the price. You could never pay the price. You could never do enough to get your own uh, sin covered for. You could never do enough to keep your salvation. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. And as, as Jesus hung on the cross, he took the wrath of God for you and me because we all deserve eternal damnation. We all deserve hell. But Jesus, out of his love for us, died on the cross in our place so that we could have everlasting life. And it didn't end there. We had the death of a king, right? But three days later, he rose again. He rose again. And when he did that, he beat sin. He beat death. It wasn't holding on to him like it was on to us. But Jesus, in defeating death and sin, did it not only for himself. He defeated it himself, but he did it for you and me. And the Bible says that who would, who, whoever would receive that love can have eternal life. The Bible says it's with the heart that man believes unto salvation. And with mouth, confession is made known. I want to know if you received the love of God. Have you received his love? Our theme has been long live the king. He lives for us. 
and we serve a risen and living Savior. But the saying, long live the king, I had to look it up and see where did this saying come from? And it came from centuries and centuries of people saying it, but the first saying from what I could tell was this, the king is dead, long live the king. And so it's a picture of the elderly father king who has passed away, he's had a good kingship, now his son is gonna reign in his place, and so we want him to go well. We want to wish him well. We hope that, that he has a long reign and a prosperous reign. And so the king is dead. Long live the king. When we think about Jesus, the king died, but he rose again. Long live the king.